Left. Right. Recently, a friend and colleague passed away. Prior to the funeral, I received quite a few questions from other people that I work with, asking what they should wear, what time they should arrive, should they bring a gift, should they send flowers, should they bring flowers. So I thought I'd use this episode to share some common funeral etiquette. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the comments. But I think this is important stuff that everybody needs to know. Uh, at some point, you will uh, know someone who's passed away, and should you choose to visit the funeral or the wake, uh, you want to know the right things to do. You certainly don't want to embarrass yourself or cr cause any frustration uh, for the family and close loved ones. This is Sip Talk. Grab a drink and enjoy. <laughs> Cheers. 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 That is the pour. That means we are live. That means this is Sip Talk, episode 178. My name is Justin DiGiulio out of my basement in New Jersey, joined by, as always, by James, the Bosnator Boswell philosopher, professional referee, bartender, most exciting of all, accountant. And today we have a special guest, Adam Sindaban, political commentator, a man of morals, a questionable man of morals, but not a man of questionable morals. And uh, today we are talking about funeral etiquette. But is he a questionable man? <laughs> he is definitely a man. He is, uh, <laughs> but he's a, he's a questionable man of morals. No question on that. That's, we do know. question him a lot. So today we're going to talk about funeral etiquette. Uh, a lot of you know, we, we lost somebody from my company uh, a couple weeks ago. The funeral is is tomorrow, and. Just thinking about funeral etiquette a little bit, and I, some people reached out to me from the company saying, hey, what do I wear? What time do I show up? What should I do? I don't know this religion. So we're going to talk about a lot of these topics. You know, I've been to a decent number of funerals in my lifetime, more than, you know, anybody wants to go to. I mean, any funeral is more than anybody wants to go to. Um, but, uh, you know, I did a little research. So I think we share that. I think it would be good for people who haven't been to funerals before um, and people who are afraid of funerals. Funerals can be a really... Uh, anxiety-inducing uh, place to go, an event to go to, and they're usually not fun. So uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But first, just like any good funeral, we're going to start with drinks. James, what are you drinking down there in sunny South Carolina? I got the remnants of a bottle of Riesling and a freshly cracked bush ice. Nice. How? Uh, when was that bottle of Riesling cracked or popped? Uh, the The girlfriend came by earlier tonight and gave me some of the bottle that she bought okay so it's, it's a fresh but fresh bottle um i always like to wine actually actually like to throw some liquor in there today we have uh we have some liquor here we got some some warm doers which is my top tier first choice for the go-to i'm gonna we've, we've been we're running a little late tonight so i've had this glass of ice in front of me for a little while i'm gonna drink the water residue here right uh, yeah doers doers isn't a bad choice when you're drinking with a purpose Jesus Christ. Um, well, I I just like to sip on it. You know, I usually put a lot. I don't, I'm, not a, I'm a big whiskey fan, a big scotch fan. I don't like to put ice in good uh, in good rye or good scotch. But uh, I wouldn't say that Dewar's is a great scotch. So I don't walk, think anyone would. You want to that a little bit. <laughs> I didn't think it was up for debate. And uh, yeah. it's so bad. Um, so, look, we're... Should we hit current events first, or should we just hop right into the fun stuff and start talking about females? Um, I got one fun current event. Okay, hit, hit me with your current event here. Um, let me pull up the, the exact article, so that way I'm not misquoting at all. Um, this is brilliant, though. It's a Tennessee State House representative that, um, hold on, here we go, offers Hitler as an inspiration to the homeless. Um, inspiration to the homeless? 
Yes. So State Senator Frank Nicely uh, made his remarks on the Senate floor in Tennessee during a debate on a bill to make camping or soliciting along state highways or exit ramps a misdemeanor. And then he says he was going to give his fellow lawmakers a history lesson, adding that in 1910, Hitler took to the streets and practiced his oratory and people skills. Hit, quote, Hitler decided to live on the streets for a while. For two years, Hitler lived on the streets and practiced his oratory and body language to connect with the masses. And then he went on to lead a life that got him into the history books. <laughs> so a lot of these people, it's not a dead end. They can come out of this. These homeless camps have a productive life, or in Hitler's case, a very unproductive life. I support this bill. <laughs> that is insane. Is this a Tennessee state bill? It's not a federal bill, right? Yeah, Tennessee state bill. But I just think, like, I want you all, all you homeless people that think that things are bleak, and as you stare at your shopping cart that contains all of your worldly belongings, know that if you put in the work, you too can be like Hitler. That's effectively what he said. That's, so is the slogan for 2022, like, let's go Hitler? Is that, is that kind of like where we're headed at this rate? I think let's go Adolf has a better ring to it. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. That could probably fit on a bumper sticker pretty well, right? That, that is, uh, that's terrible. Was you he know, yeah. Pause? I'm curious. No, he, or he, or he, maybe, he, maybe it would just be like, Adolf had some good ideas. Yeah, but the thing is, you need to, I see what he was trying to do. The issue was that he, uh, he, he didn't fully comprehend the, the other things that go along with that. And, and <laughs> like everything? You can't use a bad person. You can't use it. You can't attribute any, which is which is really fucked up. But you know, because you have to take everything at a hundred percent, three hundred sixty degrees. The problem is when somebody's so bad. Like I said, well, here's an example. I said recently, Bill Cosby, great TV show, terrible person, a lot of good lessons from the TV show, terrible person. But uh, you know, for a lot of people, they say, "You how how could you say that about the show?" Well, I think everybody agreed at the time. It was a good show. You yeah, because yeah, well, people didn't know about what he was doing. But the, the take home and the messages in the in the show, very good. I mean, yeah, well, that's fair. I mean, I've made my point about that to it, like Kevin Spacey, like still a great actor, also a creep, right? Like we can, well, we can acknowledge both ends of that. Like, you can also, like, to, to bring the point as close to home as possible, you can look at Hitler and, as I said, like Adolf had some good ideas. Like he was in favor of socialized medicine. He was against smoking. He was a vegetarian. Like, all three of those are kind of good ideas, but you don't want to use Hitler as, like, saying, like, yeah, Hitler was in favor of it, so it's a good idea. You can find other people that also support it and say, like, yeah, here's the reasons why socialized medicine might be a good idea. Never mind the fact that Hitler was in favor of it. Yeah, you don't use your poster boy as a... Uh... I'm sure we can find somebody else who is a vegetarian... And for socialized medicine, so, to, yeah, know. there's there's a better <laughs> a standard bearer that you that you should be looking for. Where did he say this? On like the state floor, like yeah, the, yeah, in the state senate. Did he get like a rousing applause? I'm actually very curious about that. No. Um, I don't well. believe it that was well received. Oh man, All right, I so want to see this video. It's what else? What else are we missing? Uh, um, I'll put a link for you guys to. All right, we'll check it. We'll check it later. Well, I have uh, one topic of current events I'd like to bring up. You're going to love this one, James. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm a little... Okay, so I'm actually not going to go the Elon Musk route because I, I think it's too much of a hot topic, but I'm actually curious on everyone's take on... Recently, there was a bill that DeSantis passed in Florida. I know he's got a lot of heat for this anti-gay bill and it not being very well represented in the media, but he did sign into law a financial literacy test that every kid in 12th grade has to pass in order to graduate high school. And it's for the entire state of Florida. And the financial literacy test includes understanding credit scores, understanding how to save money, how to, you know, create a budget for yourself and sort of, you know, how to purchase a home. And it's a financial literacy. Yeah. Thing. Like just basically how to like be a productive person. So when you, it's, it's, it's really the delivery of this one. When you say he's saying everybody has to pass this financial literacy test, what, we're, what really is happening here? is he saying schools need to teach financial literacy and just like anything else schools teach students must pass it yeah but there's yeah. a lot of loopholes there in terms of being able to graduate without passing anything um, i'm sure robin would be able to comment on how rampant that problem is 
Sure. I'm not saying that like it's not filled with loopholes, but I'm saying that the messaging itself coming from him, I think whether you want to argue against other politics of himself, I think that's probably the smartest state bill I've seen passed in, I would say, the last decade. Plus. I, I Truthfully, I'm being honest. I, 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 I think Florida is a better place to live than Texas. I'll give you that. Well, Yo, they're both in kind of like a competition for the bottom right now. Yeah, but I, I don't know the intricacies of that law. It sounds decent to me. Now, the don't say gay bill is how it was sold. It's it terrible. Shouldn't, it shouldn't have been sold that you can't talk about non-heterosexual relationships and sex prior to third grade. Right. What it should have been was you can't talk about sex prior to third grade. And there should have been some standardized, if children ask you about that, you refer them to, to ask their question to a guidance counselor or, parent. or to their parents. I, I think the bigger issue was less so like was less so the prohibition on certain things than the vagueness in which it was written. And that's even less of an issue than the fact that it allows parents to sue school districts. And in a lot of civil um, cases, if you're the one who brings suit and you lose, you are responsible for the other party's legal fees because like you drag them into this, you're responsible for their payment and it was bullshit because you lost. So you have to pay for their inconvenience. And in the, in the Florida law, it specifically says that the school district cannot recom like reclaim legal expenses from the um, plaintiff. So yeah. it, it's, it's a way for parents to just sue school districts into financial oblivion with really no negative consequences to anybody bringing these bound to be frivolous lawsuits. It's, okay, that's, it's, that's it's a, a fair, it's, a, it's really it's just bad. It's a badly written law. It's fully agenda driven. It's very anti-gay driven, which is you know my issue was that it, it should be about all sexuality. Sure, it I mean it's not like because, Alabama is the you know the frontier for you know open gay community down there, and then. Well, Feel like that wasn't like any surprise, but they might be leaping Florida soon, though. Yeah, so, but but and, these anti-gay bills are anti-abortion bills too. I mean, these, they're going to bite. They're going to bite all these governors and senators in the ass because maybe, all that agenda-driven well, shit is just cultural wall bullshit. That like doesn't very doesn't. I understand it can affect some individuals, but like at the same time, it's really just a way to like rival up bases on the cultural war basis, like we did in '04 and like. 06 and 08. And, yeah, what's the matter with Kansas? Right. So um, it's just, it's, I don't right. know. I think right. it's a bunch of hogwash. To be. I, I want to get into the funeral stuff because you guys are actually bringing up some stuff that I'd love to talk on for another 25 minutes each. But I think we can, maybe if we have some time at the end, we can get back to this stuff. But for now, let's dive into the fun stuff. We're talking about funerals. Now, uh, funerals are a shame. I mean, nobody wants to be participating in a funeral, and nobody wants to be the uh, um, the on honorary uh, uh, person for the funeral. Uh, that's not that's not fun. But if you do find yourself dead and you're throwing a funeral for yourself, here's what you want your guests to do, basically. Uh, James, you've been to a lot of funerals. I've been to two and a half. Uh, the, you want to explain that half? Half a margin there. What? <laughs> Third one was a mix-up. It was it was a wedding. Uh, no, it, it was a, a friend of my roommate's who who died suddenly, and like I had to get off of work, so I showed up maybe like fifteen minutes late, and then like made a quiet entrance, sat in the back, didn't say anything, and then like like my roommate was super close with the guy who died, so mm -hmm. like I showed up mostly just for him, um, but I had to get back to work. So, like, I was there for 15 minutes, sat in the back, and then immediately left. Didn't go to, like, the reception or anything else. So, I don't, I consider that, like, a half. Whereas, like, the two other funerals I was part of, 100%. Okay. Uh, all right, so. So, 100%. Let's talk about those. Uh, well, no, I, I don't want to get in. I don't need this. No, I'm not going to tell the story about it. They're, they're boring. I'm saying, like, let's, let's get into what a few funeral is well, and, and some of the so, questions we've thought about. Um, first off, you know, a lot of whether or not you attend the funeral depends on how well you know the person. Now, there's two different parts of the standard funeral that I'm aware of in my research that seems to be pretty common. Now, I'm speaking, you know, I was raised Catholic, uh, raised in the United States, so this is mostly what I know. 
I could be missing some other cultures, some other religions, but these are probably the vast majority of the funerals that you might attend in the US. This is usually how they go. So right off the bat, um, your dress. So it is general, generally accepted that you will wear dark clothes. You don't want to be wearing any bright clothes. So uh, pastels or neon colors are really taboo when it comes to funerals. And it really just, it's an insensitive thing. And, and one, it screams that you don't know, but it's also offensive to people because, you know, there's somber times. There are some, some cultures where people go into mourning for weeks and even months, uh, and there's different stages of mourning. So when you're sad and you're mourning, you're usually, uh, usually not dressed in uh, floral and, uh, and colors. So uh, you want to dress in darker clothes. It's generally uh, accepted to dress up for funerals. So that may mean putting on a suit and a tie. Uh, funeral is probably one of the only places where I would endorse wearing a black pair of shoes. Uh, I, you know, I wear dress clothes most days out of the week. I don't own a pair of black shoes. I feel like they look very FBI-like. Uh, or I feel like I'm a waiter, so yeah. I, but I do have I do have dark brown shoes, and that would be the the color brown that I would wear to a funeral. Yeah, I, I think dress for funeral is really simple. Guys, black suit, white shirt, black tie, black shoes, black belt. Girls, well, I don't know crap about women's fashion, but I don't know black dress. Yeah, and I think uh, if you just wear dark grays, uh, but darker colors is is acceptable um when it comes to flowers uh flowers were uh became popular in funerals because funeral homes would hold the body and dead bodies don't smell the greatest so they used to stock the rooms full of flowers flowers aren't as super important nowadays because we've come further with technology when it comes to keeping bodies preserved which is pretty uh, uh morbid to think about but if you're going to, if you want to send flowers, you send them to the funeral home in advance. It's not the best idea to show up to the funeral with flowers, like you're showing up to your prom date. Well, yeah, it sounds like so, you're gonna like put a corsage on that. On that. Uh, <laughs> but if you if you do want to bring flowers, you shouldn't show up to the funeral or the viewing at the time of the funeral or at the time of the viewing with flowers in hand. If you are late with the flowers. Bring them to the home of the of the people. What kind of flowers do you send anyway? If you're wrong? Uh, that would be a really good question for a, a flower shop. Yeah, <laughs> talk, talk with the florist. I wouldn't go designing your own bouquet. Yeah, I, I would think not. Uh, Roses probably would be an absolute no. But point is, is, is if you want to send flowers, you do it in advance and you send it to the funeral home. You're not going to send it to the family and expect them to bring it to the funeral. For sure. I mean, also be tasteful. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like, uh, like get one of those, like, massive, like, wall mount bouquets of flowers. Those are it's got, like, a stand funerals. and everything. Those are for funerals. Yeah, but, like, you got to understand, like, if it's, like, a, if it's, like, a small thing, like, you want to get, like, this, like, overbearing, like, massive, you know, I, thing of flowers, and then, like, it just kind of takes over the whole, like, Well, you know, typically the flowers situation. are on stands. If you... Yeah, but, like, but, there's different sizes to that. You want to... Yeah, let me ask this question. Yeah. Do you bring a card? Uh, I would. You could mail a card, or you could drop a card at at the home of the family. But you would not bring a card to the funeral home. Uh, so you're not bringing it to like the funeral ceremony. Yeah. No, receiving gifts at a funeral is not is not common at all. Um, In other cultures, it is, but not here. So it it may be acceptable to drop food or something off at the home of the of the people after the service what about a confession note uh <laughs> <laughs> what are you that, confessing well so and that's uh it's actually funny because i listened to <laughs> i listened to a podcast over the weekend about this guy and this was his job so basically he was hired by some guy who was dying the guy had like cancer or something i said hey man i need you to do me a favor my funeral's coming up i know everybody's planning for it i'm dying um what i'm going to ask you to do is my best friend is going to be giving some eulogy. And what I want you to do is about two minutes into the eulogy, I want you to stand up and say, hey, I've been hired by John to speak on behalf of the deceased, the deceased being John. Uh, first off, Joe, if you're up there giving the eulogy, 
sit the fuck down. I know you've been trying to sleep with my wife for the last two years. And then he basically goes on and rips up a bunch of the people and just tears them up. He's like, fuck off you, fuck off you. And people are like leaving the funeral home crying. Um, and then from this, somebody else said, hey, I want to introduce you to my cousin who's dying. And I think they'd really like you to do this at their funeral. <laughs> and, and now that's what this guy does on a, I don't know if it's a full-time basis, but he does it on a regular basis. One, for example, was there was like a Harley biker, like, you know, a guy, like a big guy, a biker gang. And he, uh, he came out as gay or at least bisexual uh, on his funeral after he was dead. And the guy said, hey, you know, I, you know, I couldn't face this in life. It was one of my biggest challenges. Uh, if any of you are in this position, I, I wish you the, the strength to be able to do so. But I do want to come clean. I want you to know who I really was. I was bisexual. Um, Raj's comment makes me want to, like, makes me think of a joke. I think it's a Jack Handy quote of, when I die, I don't, I don't really care if people at my funeral say he was a really nice or a really funny guy. I want them to say, boy, he sure owed me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, but in, in general, uh, some type of confession, no. It, this is not the time to confess. It's not, it's not your time, okay? It's a time to honor the deceased and remember the, the person who's passed away. And in making it more about yourself or trying to get something off your chest or to share some type of affair, it, it's not the time for that. And it's really a shame because when is the time for that? But it's definitely not when everybody is grieving and in mourning because it sure. only makes things worse. And in my opinion, it's really fucking selfish to make it more about you and to want to get something off of your chest. Hey, on the other hand, wouldn't funerals be a lot more interesting if there was a part where they said, speak now or forever hold your peace? <laughs> uh, See, like, but I, th now, I, listen, I'm, I am, I don't, I like the story he told me today about the people who are like kind of basically a stand up comedian, like reading a room quite literally in a, in a funeral parlor. But I think that's kind of funny. I think it's like, Adding a little sense of humor to something that's really morbid, a little laughter does go a long way. Well, so and that's I, the thing about funerals is there's two parts of the funeral. You have the viewing and then you have the actual uh, funeral service, which for religions, that's where the priest comes out and prays. Neither one of those is the time for humor. You may, you may say a quiet joke maybe in the back, but you don't want that. You don't even want the laughter to be audible because it's just really disrespectful for the people that are seriously mourning. And again, it's not about you. Right? It's about the person who's passed away and it's about those absolutely closest to them and to those people and to the deceased are the people to whom you owe respect. So that's not the time. Now, typically after the service, there's mm -hmm. some type of lunch or some type of get together afterwards. And that then in my experience, is where you have a couple of drinks if you weren't already drinking during the funeral service. Is that acceptable, by the way? I'm just curious for everybody. To drink during it. the funeral service? Yeah. Uh, probably yes. during is probably not a good idea. No, generally during is not. If you want to sip out of a flask in private, you are certainly welcome to. Um, I, I think that's reasonable to do so, but you don't want to do it, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You yeah, just, while the people are talking and everything, you shouldn't be just knocking them back. Well, yeah, I mean, sure. That's think that's of it like uh, like a wedding, except the sentiment is reversed. Uh, I don't know. know. They're, weddings are kind of like funerals. It's, the, it's, it's, it's really actually weddings are a double funeral. It's the end of two lives. <laughs> just just to point out though, during during my and Justin doesn't know this, so I'm, I'm about to drop this on him. But when my mom was remarrying to my now stepfather. The wedding photographer got a picture of Justin drinking out of his class during the time of them doing their vows. So I just, I just want to point out that that did happen. So he's like, Do as I say. He's a clever <laughs> photographer. You know, I thought all eyes were on the on the bride and the groom, but uh, but clearly this nosy photographer couldn't keep his nose where you know where it belonged. Ah, I think he was get, he was underpaid for this gig. <laughs> um, so look, so I want to, um, before we get to the, the viewing versus the, the funeral itself, the pure, funeral procession or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Typically when they're transporting the body and it's in a hearse and there's a, a bunch of cars following that, 
uh, they all have their hazard lights on and some of them will have uh, placards in the window that say funeral. Now it's in very poor taste to kind of try to uh, cut in between that funeral uh, and, and to honk your horn during that because presumably the people inside the cars are quite sad. It's not, you just, you got to pay attention. You really have to have some empathy. And, and, you know, a lot of people drive with road rage. I get pretty bad road rage. Every once in a while, I come up on a, a funeral and I go, oh, shit, let me back off these guys, go around them. But you don't want to be honking your horn. You don't want to be cutting in between the cars. Yo, but, I did that once on accident. And boy, were a whole bunch of people pissed. Exactly. And you don't want people. Like, I didn't mean to. I just didn't know. And I was like, oh, like, yeah, yeah these, like. They're not happy with me right now. You don't want the yeah. It's, how it's, do they ever did that? Well, it's poor case. You you know you may not even know. But how the fuck do you do that though in New York City? The funeral is gonna be in Harlem. Like it, it's not like you get like well, this, open road on. But highway. where's the cemetery? If there was if, if if there was a cemetery. So typically, what happens is first you have the viewing. The viewing is you don't have to be on time for the viewing. It's usually a two hour block or so, and you come in. And you pay your respects. You usually approach the coffin. A lot of uh, Christian people say some prayers. I don't know about the other religions. You say some prayers for the coffin. This is kind of like your final goodbye, especially if it's an open casket. It's the last time you're going to be seeing this person's body. And then you step away. Uh, and then you can go to the back of the room or you can step outside. Usually there's a bunch of people smoking outside, in my experience. That might be the time to open a flask, but, uh, but definitely not inside of the, the venue. And uh, you don't have to be on time, though. You, it's just kind of in and out. Usually there is a, a guest book. Now, the guest book, you can sign your name, but that's not a place to write your condolences. No. So a lot of that's, I think that's a good tip for people. You don't write, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss. You just write your name. You're paying your respects. At some point, maybe somebody will go through this and see who attended and compare it to somebody else's list. I don't know. It's a little strange that they do this, but it's not a yearbook, so you're not in there writing uh, your, you know. Have the book. best summer ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what and, the fuck and, is and, enjoy, enjoy your trip, you know. Uh, that's not happening. So uh, so then you go from the viewing. Usually the viewing ends, and the pallbearers then have to load the body in the hearse to be transported to the uh, the graveyard. Uh, to the cemetery. Sorry, graveyard is a bit more awesome. That, that, that was not my experience. In in my experience, the funeral home handled loading the, the coffin into the hearse, and the pallbearers didn't do anything until the hearse got to the cemetery, and then, like, then the pallbearers moved the coffin from the hearse to wherever the grave was. Yeah, that's been my experience, too, actually, and I, I've been to quite a few funerals, and that's that's normally how it goes. I don't really, I don't think I've ever seen anyone, like, carry the... the that's what the that's what the Paul Bear is right, but I've no, never... but not from the funeral home setup to the hearse. It's from the hearse to the cemetery, but while the coffin is in the funeral home, the funeral home handles it. I uh, I've been a Paul Bear about a half dozen times and had to move the casket. And so you're usually recruited for them, usually very heavy. Oftentimes, though, in the funeral home, the uh, the casket is on. Uh, like, we like a rolling yeah. rolling stand, but they do have to lift it and they have to get it into the hearse. Some hearses have wheels in them, um, but usually the pallbearers are just kind of there to make sure everything goes smoothly. So I was a pallbearer in two of them, and neither of those times did we have to move the the casket within the funeral home. Either way, though, the 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 body's being transported um, from the funeral home to the cemetery. Um, uh, Actually, I'm sorry. You have the viewing. They don't transport the body anywhere. Usually the viewing is in the church. And then the ceremony starts. Then the funeral service starts. So the service is the actual mass that the priest gives. And there's usually praying. There's usually They don't give communion or anything at the, uh, at the, at the Christian funeral services. But they do say the, the Christian prayers. And, uh, and then from the funeral service, then they transport the body to cemetery you miss one thing about the funeral procession which is that when you're in the funeral procession the goal is to get to the cemetery as quickly as possible 
So you want to be like passing everybody to get there. <laughs> uh, yeah, oddly, uh, the hazard lights really help with this. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> oddly, funeral uh, processions drive really slow. So, and that's probably because they're full of old people. That's that's my guess. Um, that was the age so, of this Usually true, you know, more old people die than young people. Um, all right, so we get close funeral you know, procession. Uh, but when it comes to being on time, the actual service is not something you want to be late to. And if you do find yourself late to the funeral service, what James said that he did was you quietly come to the back door and you step in. You don't want to make a scene. You don't want doors to be closing behind you. Remember, tensions can be a little high. People who are mourning may you make some noise when you're entering they may turn to you and for whatever reason people are upset and these high strung times they may want to take it out on you for this yeah reason. you're late sneak in that's a fair point uh, i agree with that hey i got a question for everybody would you guys take photos with people you haven't seen in a long time at a funeral um okay so that's a good take question. as many selfies as you can at a funeral um that way you can show everybody at the funeral how important it is to you and like use lots of flash photography so that they can see that you want to make sure that like everyone knows that you want this to be memorable oh my god yeah so that's that's the general rule you want to draw as much attention to yourself taking photos it's it's really good to bring in a a, a ring light maybe a tripod uh on the contrary actually uh funerals are a very it's very poor taste to take photos during the funeral oh, yeah. during the viewing it is especially inside of the place that, that inside of the venue the funeral home uh usually it's very somber you can be a little louder outside but uh in general inside you refrain from uh being too jovial you're definitely not taking photos very very poor taste to be taking photos uh, now, again, if there's an event afterwards and you're seeing people that say you haven't seen in 10 years or, you know, we're getting older, so 10 years seems like a really reasonable amount of time to end up not seeing somebody. Um, those are the times that you, you could be a bit more lighthearted and maybe some photos with people you haven't seen would be all right. But outside of the venue, uh, after the person is in the ground and, and covered back with dirt, you're, you're, you're well removed from the initial event. But now, in all seriousness, what what do you guys think the biggest no nos are in a funeral though? Because like for me, I think the biggest no no is probably don't sleep with uh, you know with the widow. I, I I would think that'd probably be a little distasteful. At least you want to wait a couple of weeks. So, <laughs> um, I don't know. Like it's part of the grieving process. This is how you move on. Uh, so uh, the biggest no no is really just being cognizant of the atmosphere in in inside the, the venue and really that's led by the closest family to that person so you know for some people they try to keep it light they try to keep it joking they try to keep it not too heavy and that is to a degree a coping mechanism for some people but the general rule is, is follow their lead so when you arrive at the viewing prior to the funeral you arrive at the viewing, typically the closest family is standing and they are receiving the guests so um when you see the closest family it's really just the opportunity to shake hands uh acknowledge their loss not to acknowledge your loss okay these people are closer to the deceased so you're there to acknowledge their loss you're not there to share any old stories you're just there to say, hey, guys, you know, I'm really sorry. My condolences. And move on. Um, but you shake some hands. You know, oftentimes people. Yeah, if you're people, not like a close family member, if you're just showing up like in your in like they're greeting you or whatever, you say, good to see you again. Sorry for your loss. And then move. I'd, I'd, I'd leave out the good to see you again. I don't know. <laughs> I just. And that's the thing. All right, fine. Then just say sorry for your loss. I don't know. Keep it to like. Keep it to one or two sentences, because no, but you can you can say something along the lines of like uh, you know it's good to see you despite the circumstances. Okay, uh, I'm very sorry for your loss. I mean, whatever. Yes, but, yeah, but, but, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. Is the is the is the general rule? So you get away with that because you're a man of few words. I may be a man of questionable morals, but 
No. Uh, you're not a man of questionable morals, Adam. You're a man. You're a questionable man of morals. You just you you, you have these hardline morals, and 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 they are and and they are you know basically true north, but they're just odd the morals that you choose. That's why you're questionable because you make you 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 know moral in some respects very moral, true north, um, and then not you know then you got some other. You, that you're not so I got nice. some gray area. Yeah, There's some more magnetic north than the true north. Um, all right, so guest book, receiving people. Yeah, again, it's not the time for stories. It's really quick. You know, just remember that. So wait, if a, I catch up with other friends, though, and I see them and, and we're talking about Kamali and we're all kind of just standing there, our hands in our pockets, I have definitely been in that situation. And, like, somebody will be like, man, I do remember that time. And what, but this is not... And, if you're milling around while like people are filtering in and you're having a quiet conversation among like some some of your friends or whatever, I don't think that's much of an issue. It's more like the the close family or like the close friends that are being like an actual part of the funeral. They got too much else going on, so like keep your interaction with them kind of to a minimum. Because oh, like when I was in the two funerals that I was a part of, but it was my grandparents, so I was like a pretty big player in the funerals in terms of like the things that I had to do, and like. The last thing I wanted to do was talk to random people for 20 minutes. Oh, and, and sure. That, and, yeah, that's, that's and that's the idea, especially when it's close to you, when it's immediate family. You you don't want to, like, it's as about as miserable as it gets. You are, you are, if not one of the most miserable people there, the most miserable people there are in your, uh, uh, you know, you're there to console them. So it's not lighthearted. And, and somebody trying to be lighthearted when your mind isn't, there isn't it's it's just not helpful at all no. and and there's an art in being lighthearted at events like this while still being serious these are not the time to find out if you're already good at it or to practice and see if you're in that yeah place. don't try out new material folks yeah uh, i don't know it sounds like comedians <laughs> they have an alternative route if they can't make it at the comedy cellar here so, uh, so on uh, we talked about taking photos so the thing is also about phones it is extremely important to have cell phones on vibrate, uh, not to have um, not to have your ringtone go. But now I notice so many people all all over the place just listening to videos on their phone and listening to stuff on their phone at it. Not just a, a, a volume that's audible from somebody that's four or five feet away, but a volume that's audible from somebody that's forty or fifty feet away. Sure. So, you know, you see somebody open up Instagram and then before you know it, you got a dog eating a hot dog and making all these fart noises or something. That's not the time to be checking your Instagram and having the volume to the max. Like it's not that's and that's something you want to check before you go into it. And a lot of people aren't in the habit of doing that. And it's embarrassing for them. And it, and it ought to be, you know, it's not uh, not a good look. So check yourself. Unless the video you're listening to is how to behave at a funeral. Hmm. That's a go? great, that's a really good passive aggressive way to enforce etiquette at the rest of the funeral. If you they can all hear it. You open up this podcast. Yeah. You're, you were, you know, you'll be well received. Oh, is that sip talk? Oh, you know, let me tell you about my favorite episode. My favorite no, no, no. It's just, you should yeah. listen to this. They've got some good advice. By the way, the funeral is going on right now. So take note. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, and, and I mean this episode to be very serious and I, I'm trying to give as much information. Drink enough then, geez. Well, I, I'm trying to give as much information as possible, you know, lighthearted. I'm not, even when it comes, you know, when I go to a funeral, I, I tend to stay pretty somber and, and pretty well composed, but you don't want to add misery to the event, but you also don't want to add too much levity. So I, you know, the tips and the stuff that we're mentioning right now, you know, take for what they're worth, but just understand that one, be happy. It's not your funeral. And two, the funeral is really for the people that are closest to that person. And it is a shame, but my thinking is that if you're going to go to a funeral, and this is so another thing is you bring let, let me circle back to just how you want to be behaving at the funeral but a good question is do you bring children to a funeral and i think that it is very important for children to experience funerals at an early enough age because death is part of the life cycle sure in every one you know 
will be dead at some point in their lifetime or after your lifetime. And everybody you know in their lifetime, <laughs> how it will young? certainly come How young, them. though? How young is young? Well, it does have to do with behavior. So if you have a two or three year old that is rambunctious, you may bring them there. And then your stay at the funeral may be very, very short. Or maybe you have someone watch them outside because they can't keep themselves in You just bring like a heavy gauge ruler. <laughs> um, but, the, but the idea is that children and people who are new to this world, namely children, uh, should experience these things because it would be really lousy to be 25 years old and have never gone to a funeral before and then you don't know how to act and what and what most people do when it comes to acting is they pick up cues from people around them so if you go to a funeral and most of the people at the funeral are crying blithering muttering to themselves whimpering that may be how you behave and you may be you may be overcome by the emotion of others now you have to mourn and grieve in your own way and i'm not going to shit on anyone that is is you know crying and hysterical at funerals because that is part of the mourning process sure. however in my opinion i would rather be the well-composed person offering console for the people that are nearby rather than the blithering muttering whimpering fool in the corner who can't keep themselves composed and I think that you will provide more value being the well-composed person overall to all the people that are in attendance than, than those that are hysterical. So you mean like being a steady hand, basically, being and for hand. those at home that are And it's easier. I, can, you know, I, I typically am that person when it comes to going to funerals, not because I, I uh, don't have any emotion, <laughs> um, although some might question that, but because you know, I experienced some of this at a young age. And I, I witness a different range of different people's emotions. Sure. And now I, I have that imprinted onto me. And there are times, you know, somebody passed away. It was, it, it can be very emotional for me when I found that our, our friend and former colleague, Kamali, passed away. Um, her and I were not super, super close, but it did, it did hit me a little, and, and it was, yeah. it was really sad. Um, but, you know, you. you you don't want to be the person that is obnoxious and hysterical. And I think bringing children to the funeral uh, at an early age is a really good way to, to set them up for success later in life when it comes to being composed. Sure. I mean, I, I, I'll be the first one to say like, you know, it definitely hit me pretty hard when I found out that she passed away. Um, but that, that being said, yeah, you're right. Like, being composed at a funeral is obviously the most important thing. And going back to the children thing, I, 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 when I was a kid, I think the youngest I was ever at a funeral was about like six or seven years old. And I had experienced real loss. <clears throat> the emotional capacity when you're six, seven years old, you don't, you don't have a developed amount of emotional intelligence. So you really don't know like how to deal with anything. You're just kind of like, why is everybody crying? What's what's going on? I'm not feeling the same vibe. By you, you also mirror what everyone else is doing. And if sure. The adults around you are hysterical. And there's a comment from TikTok from uh, just three nine eight nine Isica said uh, ten plus is the age. Otherwise, it's too dramatic. I respectfully disagree. Yeah, I was there at six when my grandpa. I think I think that your capacity for dealing with things like this will be dictated by, you know, dealing with them. Yeah. And absolutely. you may be six years old crying your eyes out, and it may be very traumatic, but it is death, and death is trauma. And it's it's really sad, but that is part of life. And I think sheltering the young people from that part of life is doing a disservice to them. I think it's really important that young people have imprinted on them at a young age that life is temporary and that you need to make the most of it and you value it because and, one day the people you love may be gone the next and you may as well so yeah you need, so you need to make the most of i mean look of I, life. I i remember you know and and i think to your point you're right like because by the time i was about 16 my father lost his business partner for 25 years 30 years and also my godfather and 
I remember it was open casket, which we can debate about in a minute, but I definitely, that emotion hit me really hard. And it was the first time I ever actually, like, did not have full composure at a funeral. And I remember it, and it definitely was trauma for me because I couldn't handle or control any emotional reaction. I remember walking up to the casket, and I just completely broke down. Um, and my father had to literally help pick me up and, you know, escort me outside. One of the few times in my life that I, I really felt like I was completely out of control, but I think I had just been to a lot of funerals, and, like, I was at an age of about 16 years old where, like, my emotions were developed enough where, like, not only do you really feel the moment, but it hits you in a way that, you know, you're not... I guess, you know, at that age, I wasn't well prepared for it. prepared but, for it, but that you have to go through it. And yeah. I think the best way to prep children for a funeral is to let them know that there's room for one more if they if they act out. <laughs> oh man, remind I, me never to let you I, hang with my kids. I'm actually <laughs> I'm actually enjoying James' commentary. So prior to the episode, we text back and forth about this a little bit, and I was like, yeah, I think funeral etiquette would be a good topic to discuss on tonight's episode considering it's relevant in my circle uh you know especially tomorrow we're attending a funeral and james you know james said yeah etiquette it's important to wear bright clothes and, that. and then rosh is reading these messages and he's going um uh i sincerely disagree actually this is my thing and i'm thinking like rosh you were missing the sarcasm you were missing the sarcasm here and uh and i let it play out for you know a couple of messages back and forth and i you know i think rosh is getting a little offended because he's like james is you know, James is—he's trying to offer his advice, but but James is actually really wrong on this one. <laughs> yeah, like wear the flashiest clothing you have so that you can show how much the person in the funeral brightened your life. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, and then oh uh, and then Raj Raj was very respectful with doing you know with, with trying to correct James. I even respectfully, I, I this is my take. <laughs> and I could see Raj like sitting there reading these messages like three, four, five times, being like, hey, and he starts typing. I can't say so, that. No, no. So, but my take on bring the child to to a funeral is uh, you want to explain to them about death, and it's important for children. At, you know, three or four might be a bit young, but at some point it's going to come up. You know, where what? So where is grandma? Or you know, so where is uncle so and so? And I think you have to explain to them that that's how life works uh because they have to know there has to be some logic you can't give them this tooth fairy santa claus easter bunny bullshit you have to give them some real world explanation in not being too too serious and then you need to prep them for the event and say hey there is going to be some people there that are very upset there are going to be some people there that are more composed it doesn't mean they're not equally upset people express their emotions differently now, when you go there, you are welcome to, you know, behave any way you like. Please remain composed uh, as much as possible so that you don't create any additional uh, distress to other people at the event. And uh, and we'll try to make it quick and, and, you know, you pay your respects and that's what this is for. Yeah, when you're explaining to kids about the concept of death, it's really important that you tell them that it can happen to anybody at any time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's and that well, that's well, that's really <laughs> yeah. You're being sarcastic. You're being sarcastic. Come on. Uh, Would you take a child to the open casket and be like, "There's grandma"? No, no, that's a bad idea. I agree. I think the open. I think visiting the casket with the child is probably too much. Um, I I actually think that's probably. I need to speak with a psychologist, uh, but uh, that's some traumatizing shit because they don't I'd look. Say, and I'd say probably like teenager is it would be like the age cut off that I would set. Yeah, well, I'd say 10, 10 to twelve on the on the. Earliest. I was gonna say twelve plus thirteen. All plus. right, so we're close. Yeah, but yeah, I would but definitely not, not do under not, ten. That not is six years up. old. Not seven. No, no, no. I I agree with the general idea. Somewhere between ten and thirteen. Yeah, uh, depending on the maturity of the kid. Uh, yeah, like. An eight-year-old or a five-year-old, like walking up to a fucking casket like that. I... No, of course it, all, a it also up depends move. on the maturity of that individual child. And so, uh, wasn't that and I've met some mature five-year-olds before. But <laughs> let me tell you, 
Yeah. Did they do your accounting for you, James? But yeah, like that explains the quality of my returns, man. Like how this is how I'm turning a profit on the entire thing. They think that three dollars is a fortune. <laughs> how much do you spend on that candy bar? Hundred dollars. <laughs> how much? How much do you think that car costs? One hundred dollars. Yeah. So like they do, they do thirty tax returns for me, and they're like almost at the. They can almost purchase a car. Uh, uh, actually, so Rosh just sorry to, uh, to pivot here. I'll but tell you, Rosh, the Indian ones are actually pretty good at it. The Rosh just shared that Barbara Corcoran, the founder of Corcoran Real Estate Group, uh, she. Uh, she celebrated her 70th birthday by pretending she was dead. So she invited people to this party and then she laid in the coffin. And that's, that's, you know, uh, un unfortunately our, our deceased friend that we're visiting the funeral for tomorrow is also oh, no. a comedian. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at first I actually thought I got a message at like seven ten in the morning. I was like, Oh, this is a joke, but why is it coming from this person? And uh, you know, I, I I still have like some hope in my mind that, but that's that's the fucked up thing about death is like your mind goes to weird places, and and it's a, it's a shame. Well, I think it depends on like the the nature of like how the person died. Because like if it was sudden and unexpected, you're going to handle it very differently than like a chronic illness that just kind of took its course. It's so true, man. Because the way that that our friend died is not something that was expected you know it was a very unexpected almost like shocking news meanwhile like if you're looking at somebody who's i don't know got congestive heart failure has cancer or has any of these you know uh, and you got time you you can see it coming and you got time to prepare right your your mind actually works in that way where it just slowly starts to just kind of build up some kind of you know uh like footing to it but I, I don't know, like that that shocking death, like yeah. out of nowhere. It just you, just catch you, yeah. And, yeah, and, and, you deal with, and you deal with those differently. So I want to offer one more tip, uh, and it's where you sit when it comes to funeral. Uh, but James, you think we can get back into the moral and ethical questions after after this last tip? You want to pull those up because we got a few more left in those on that on that core list. Yeah, and moral and ethical question: yeah. Is it is it okay to tell bad jokes at a comedian's funeral? Um, so back to, <laughs> oh my God. back to, uh, the last tip I want to give you. I didn't drink enough for this podcast. Back to the last tip I want to give you about funerals is where to sit. And, uh, I'm, I'm happy to change the question. Uh, where do you sit at a funeral? So, uh, I'm Catholic. Sick. Catholics don't like to sit in the front of the church, <laughs> but, uh, but no matter what, unless you are immediate family, you don't want to sit in the first or the second row. Uh, now you don't want to sit in the very back. Uh, people might assume that you were like the person that person was having an affair with, maybe. <laughs> but, but, uh, but you don't want to sit in the first or the second row uh, because that's reserved for the immediate family. However, you can sit anywhere else in the uh, inside of the church or inside of the venue. Uh, it's just important to sit there quietly and be respectful during that. And uh, you know, somebody asks you to move or tells you this is reserved. It's better just not to argue with them and to, to move over and give people space. A lot of times family want to be close to each other and somebody asks you to move, that's usually the reason. And also bear in mind, the thing about funerals is people are really on edge. So you do have to walk on some eggshells with certain actions and around certain people. And it sucks that you have to do so. But remember, it's not about you. And you're doing so out of respect for the person that's passed away. And Just be quiet that, and reserved and say the least amount possible and you'll stay out of trouble. And, yeah, if you don't have that respect for the person that, that's passed away, then maybe it's not your place to be there. And, uh, and that's that. I'm actually curious, Nat, to know how this funeral is going to be tomorrow. When we're having this conversation, it's very somber. Like, what if it's the complete opposite? Well, it, she is a comedian, and um, it was an unexpected death, so... I do imagine that people will be inadvertently trying to pay tribute to her with some humor because what brings us all together in her circle for the most part is her comedy. And just like when you go to a comedy show and people try to 
also tell jokes from the audience, which is the weirdest thing I ever see. People trying to be funny, funny. in the audience. I know. You I recently know. went to a comedy show. It's really weird where the comedian runs out of material and then picks some people in the crowd, and the people in the crowd try to be funny, but it's not rehearsed and usually just bad. It just and it they try sense. to keep talking. It's, I know. It's, it's really bad. So I, I'm hoping it's not going to be like that. But then again, like I don't. I don't know too many people outside of you know the friends we both mutually had, so it's like I don't I don't know what it's well, gonna be like. The people that we know, we can. We I'm gonna lodge a prediction that the actual funeral ceremony is gonna be pretty somber, and then if there's a reception, that's when it'll open up. Um. So uh, Let, let's hit some of these questions. Let's hit some yeah, questions. that's good. All right, morality, morals, and morality. What is both right and wrong at the same time? I got an answer. All right. You're at a stoplight and you're and you're in the right lane. And right on you red. Pin, you, yeah, you pin the gas, you take the right on red, and you didn't look to the left. Pow. That's both right and wrong at the same time. <laughs> um yes, you were taking a right turn and you were wrong to have done so. Uh that's good. So what's both right and wrong morally speaking because i don't know if that's morally speaking but that that's is not really you can't actually answer that question because it's asking you to contradict yourself yeah i agree um the the easy answer would be a white lie that's what, oh. I, that's, that's what I was going to say like uh, do i look bad in this dress type of like you can get into some more thorny ethical debates when you say like you could you could make the case that harvesting the organs from somebody is both right and wrong because those organs might save 10 lives but you're only killing one person <laughs> um yeah but i think the over overarching would be a negative on that one we'll yeah that. but like if you think about it just in pure numbers it's more right than wrong well yeah fair I did, that's that's a good point. it also depends on, on who you take the organs from. <laughs> um, yeah like your liver is not going to get too much so uh, nine is definitely not. Yeah, What's right. another question, though? Rapid fire. Give me All right, time. next one. I don't want to rapid fire too much. These are good questions. Um, the last three questions I don't really like, but I'm going to go with uh, how would the world look if there were no laws and principles? And my answer would be exactly the same. I agree with you because what happens out of order when things are in disorder is that they seek order. That's called homeostasis. And... That's where things will go because out of the disorder, people will start creating order um, because that's what we need to exist. Right, because we'll, we'll, we're we're creatures of like needing some kind of structure and order. So that 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 would. Be um, I could also argue like I can give a single word answer to that question. Somalia. Uh, I don't know. I don't know the history there. And. The in Africa, Somalia? Yeah. I don't know the history. You want to you wanna elaborate there? It's basically a failed state. Like, the, the government is, is pretty much failed, and law, like, the rule of law doesn't really apply because the government doesn't have the power to enforce much. So it's probably as close as you're going to get in the modern world to an anarcho state. Mm. All right, next question. We've got two minutes left. Um, is it immoral to test medications and procedures on prisoners if they agree to it and are compensated in some way? So the way that the question's phrased, it's an easy answer. The, the way that it's phrased is yes, because they're saying okay to it. Yeah, the issue, the is, the issue right. is, is that you're before we test things on humans, we typically test them on mice and rats and, and other similar animals and other similar mammals There's certain animal testing with, people with similar DNA. Anyway, so so uh, the, the debate about uh, animal testing and medications is completely separate like that's a whole yeah. other wormhole but, but presumably this would be something that has made its way to approvable human testing mm -hmm. and to me if people are giving the okay then it's okay well the only the only caveat here yeah, is it's funny though because they're in jail. Like, what the fuck well, are they going to do with a ten dollar bill? Well, the question is more: if the compensation made to the prisoners is made in terms of like 
reduced prison time. Mm. Now you have to say, is this really a free choice that they're making? Exactly. That that's a really good way to put a turn on this question, uh, because the, pretty much they'll do anything, even if they know it to be risky or hazardous to themselves. Yeah. So now you can say, is this really a free choice they're right. making? Is it right to subject them to this? And it looks like we need to start wrapping up. On that note, we got a minute left, James. What's going on tax season? What's the tax deadline this year? Uh, it's Monday. If you haven't filed your return or your extension by Monday, do one of the two. Return or extension being those. Adam, anything you want to add before we are off air, before we're kicked offline? No, but I'm definitely going to ponder that last question about what people in jail do for that fucking mm-hmm. sentence or money. I, I'm really going to think about that one. On now. that note, I want to thank Ross Galeb for feeding us your live comments from Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, and... Uh, all right that concludes this episode let me know what you think we missed let me know what you think we hit a home run with and uh if we were off base with anything uh throw in the comments i'm super curious thanks for watching thanks for listening i like pbr i just got priced out of it